Hi students, it's Mr. Albert Haskey here. Um, today I'm, I'm here to talk about editing. Editing is the next technique term that we are going to discuss and analyze in film. So we've talked about mise-en-scene, which um, if we pause a film and analyze everything that we see on the screen in that image, what we're doing is mise-en-scene analysis. Um, we've also talked about cinematography. So the cinematography takes a look at what the camera is doing, focusing on analyzing the camera work. And today we're going to talk about editing and the role that it plays in filmmaking. Um, some basic vocabulary. A shot is a basic unit of film. It's a continuous, uninterrupted running of the camera. And so shots are edited together to create a scene. Scenes are then edited together to create a sequence. Sequences like an act is in a play. And then, of course, sequences are edited together to create the entire film. So the role of the editor is to construct the, the film through creating a variety of different shots and cutting those shots down and splicing them or combining them with other shots to create a temporal and narrative structure for the film. So editing, in effect, directs the gaze of the audience. It draws your attention from one image to the next as you, you piece together both the space and the time and the narrative logic of the film. Editing helps to create transitions and movement between time, space, and point of view. So it guides you very seamlessly through the action as it unfolds on the screen. Now, why do filmmakers want to edit? That's an excellent question. I'm so glad you asked. Um, and early films did not really involve much editing. In the very first films, what we saw was one static, uninterrupted running of the camera. Uh, it was taken from an objective point of view, and when the filmmaker ran out of film, well, then the film was over. That was the end of the shot, end of the, the movie. Um, and essentially, editing evolved from one shot into two shots. And there's a variety of reasons for that. Perhaps the, the, the film shot was not long enough for the story to play out, so the filmmakers needed a second shot. Uh, um, Thomas Edison had an early example in the beheading of Mary, Queen of Scots. Uh, he didn't want to actually behead his actor, so he had to cut the film to replace the actor with the dummy. So, you know, the, the function of editing is derived out of necessity and kind of evolves slowly throughout film history. But essentially the key figure is uh, D.W. Griffith, who really gives us a, a textbook for how films can be edited to craft various points of view, and how differing these points of view from the objective to the subjective, from the extreme long to the extreme close-up, um, can really best serve to direct the gaze of the audience and to create essentially a more powerful narrative. Now, early on, filmmakers feared a cut-in would confuse the viewer. So if we move from an objective point of view where we can see all the action unfolding to a specific close-up, uh, filmmakers were worried that, that that might somehow confuse the viewer yeah, as they're trying to, to attempt to construct the fabulous space. Um, and one example of this was Edwin S. Porter's film, The American Fireman where we have a cut from firemen sleeping to an extreme close-up of a hand ringing an alarm. Um, and th the fear was that the audience wouldn't understand what that hand ringing the alarm meant. Now, of course, the, the subsequent shot is the, the firemen scrambling to put on their uniforms and, um, and load into the, the fire truck and, and drive away. And of course, this demonstrates that viewers are capable of constructing a narrative logic in understanding that one agent is the shot of the next. And so the hand ringing an alarm is the agent of the, the, the next shot, the firemen scrambling around to get dressed and ready to uh, do their job. And so a, a cut-in did not in any way hamper the viewer's construction of that fabulous space, uh, the fabulous time, or the narrative logic. Now, with editing, we essentially get a cinematic sensibility, which is what the, sort of the departure of film as art from the, the dramatic arts, right? Because when you go to a play, uh, you go to the live theater, you purchase a ticket, you get one point of view. And so you sit in that seat and you experience the drama
from one perspective. Now you go to a film, you get multiple points of view. Every time an, the editor or the filmmakers change um, and edit a shot and move or reframe or show a different point of view, you're getting an entirely new look on the film world. Now there's many different styles and options for editing but the dominant mode that exists globally and has since the 1930s is the classical continuity style which was essentially the continuity style of editing was developed by D.W. Griffith and it was instituted in the Hollywood studio system by the 1930s. I'm going to talk briefly a bit about what uh, some of the features of continuity editing. Continuity editing involves what's called a match on action. So that's to say that when a filmmaker and editor look at cutting, um, cutting the film, they want to do so on an action. If you have a character who's sitting down and they're going to stand and walk across the room, the appropriate time to cut would be when that character is starting to stand from their chair. And if you watch uh, films from the early silent era, well, filmmakers are trying to figure out when would be the best time to implement such a cut. And so you'd see a whole a variety of different uh, options. Some filmmakers would cut before they stand, some after. Some would have the character stand in one shot. And then in shot two, you'd see them sitting again and that character would stand up. Uh, and that would appear to us very strange today um, because we're accustomed to the logic of matching on action. So cut in the midst of an action and we see, you know, if you, if you were to really slow the film down frame by frame, you'd actually see a little bit of overlap. Um, however, it's really imperceptible because those frames go by so quickly we don't really notice. And so from shot to shot, it appears as if there's one continuous action being done. Um, another sort of rule of continuity editing is that filmmakers want to distract the viewer with other things going on in the frame. So characters might be talking, um, of course there's probably music being played, either music, diegetic music or music in the score. Uh, there could be other noises on the soundtrack. There'd be a variety of things. There's action, of course, unfolding. And so the focus of the viewer is on piecing together elements of the narrative and the story. And the goal is to not be thinking about the editing choices that the filmmakers have used. And so in this sense, editing in the continuity style should be discrete, uh, self-effacing, um, some film theorists call it invisible. So you're not actually thinking about the, the mode of editing that's taking place, but you're just focusing on the story. Um, of course, continuity editing involves following a linear timeline in any sort of scene. So we don't cut uh, back and forth in time, but we, we follow a sort of progressive flow to uh, a given scene. Continuity editing also involves shot reverse shot. So the shot reverse shot logic says that if we see a shot of a character and that character is looking at something off screen and then we get a shot um, that's intercut with a third shot of that character then we know that that second shot is what the character is looking at. So for example if, if we see a, a shot of a character looking at something off screen and we cut to uh, a shot of the, a bird in the tree and then we cut back to that character in the same as shot one then we know that uh, the gaze of that character is fixed on the bird in the tree. And so that's sort of the, the intellectual logic of shot reverse shot editing. Uh, continuity editing also involves an eye line match. So that's to say from shot to shot we consistently follow an approximation of characters' eye lines. And so continuity to editing involves um, identification with characters and their gaze, the things that they're looking at. Uh, continuity editing also involves directional consistency. So this is to say that the characters look in the same direction uh, each shot. And so if the screen space has established that one character is screen left and the other is screen right, we're going to follow that kind of directional consistency from one shot to the next. So that the, in the hopes that that helps the viewer create a coherent sense of fabulous space. Continuity editing also involves uh, what's called the 180 degree rule. And this is a line, a 180 degree line that's established for editing purposes. And my next slide will show an example of what this looks like. But that 180 degree line is also called the axis of action. 
And so the, the rule follows that once that 180 degree line is established, filmmakers can cut anywhere on the arc of that 180 degrees so long as they don't pass that line. If the camera moves past the 180 degree line, the axis of action, that is called jumping the line. And we'll see in the next slide what happens if filmmakers choose to jump the line. Now another component of um, continuity editing and the 180 degree line is that each cut should be at least a 45 degree angle or greater. And this is to avoid a sort of jarring effect that happens if we cut on less than uh, a 45 degree angle. So in this diagram we see um, the dotted line represents the axis of action. In the center of that are two characters. The, the woman is screen left and the man is screen right. And you'll notice there's three cameras set up at the bottom of the screen in the white space. And um, to the left of each camera, or to the left and or right of each camera, is the image that that camera is filming. And you'll notice that as long as we stay on the good half of the 180 degree line, that the woman will always be screen left and the man will always be screen right. We see in the three examples of the cameras there. Now if we jump the line, if we move up towards the top of that screen and see that fourth camera, what has happened there is that we've switched directional space within the frame. So suddenly the man is on the screen left and the woman is screen right. And so filmmakers realized this early on obviously and thought that it would create too much confusion. It might be too difficult for the viewer to create a coherent sense of fabulous space if characters are suddenly switching their screen direction. So as long as we remain on the good half of that 180 degree line, the axis of action, then directional consistency is going to be achieved. Now continuity editing, these conventions are so frequent that it makes them appear natural, almost inherent, like they were supposed to be this way. And in this sense, it becomes ideological because we as viewers take them for granted. And it's not until we experience editing in a different mode that we realize that uh, the, 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 these rules have been foisted onto film um, and there are other options that are available. Now, of course, continuity editing is highly economical. And of course, Hollywood being a mass-produced system, um, they realize that they, they could run most efficiently if they had very rigid rules for how we edit and it also helps establish how other things go so the lighting technicians know how to light um, the, the stage and the scenery know how to construct things um, and it, it all focuses around basically these editing principles it also allows filmmakers to shoot scenes with only one actor uh, and so they know in the editing they can go and do the magic and cut scenes together so that it appears as if two actors are talking uh, one to another, but you can actually shoot all the scenes with one actor by him or herself and then the other actor alone as well. Um, and of course these rules exist, but filmmakers often use what are called cheat shots or cheat cuts that break the spatial relationships or they might rearrange the mise-en-scene for a certain effect or simply for convenience as you move from shot to shot. Now, most viewers don't tend to notice these. You know, if you um, if you frequent the Internet Movie Database, there's a lot of times they'll put technical goofs and so forth. And sometimes there might be um, legitimate mistakes that are being made in films. But other times, these continuity errors, uh, the filmmakers may be very well aware of them. They're just going to let them slide because they rest on the the assumption that viewers aren't going to notice these subtle changes in continuity from shot to shot. And again, the reason why um, viewers tend to not notice them is because that's not what we're focused on when we're watching films. We're watching, um, trying to discern the narrative content and figure out the story logic and not so much on the, the minutia, the little details. Um, continuity editing and the gaze. So the gaze is a basic structural principle for creating narrative. Um, again, it's that shot reverse shot, the image of a character, the shot of what that character sees, and then the shot of the character again that helps cement uh, that notion. And of course the shots appear to be continuous in the film world, but that's just a, simply a function of the editing. Now filmmakers filled, uh, figured this out very early on. 
a Soviet filmmaker, Kushloff, ran experiments um, in the 1920s um, and even earlier. And the Soviets were, were sort of on the cutting edge of, of montage editing at this point in history. Um, this would be, for, would be before Stalin took power and essentially dismantled the Soviet system. Um, but Kushloff had a variety of experience where he uh, and his, his students would edit these films together and then show them to test audiences. And a couple of his experiments to illustrate the notion of the gaze and how editing works um, is that in one he had a shot of an actor that he cut into different um, segments and then he interspersed that image of the actor with a bowl of soup, a child in a coffin, and a child playing. And so he showed this little film to test audiences and said, you know, how did the, the actor feel in the first shot? And in the second and the third? And they said, well, he was certainly hungry in the first shot, and he was sad in the second shot, and he was feeling happy in the third shot because, you know, he was looking at soup, child in a coffin, and then a, a child playing. Um, but of course, the actor's face didn't change. It was the exact same shot of the actor in all three of those instances. Um, and so it was only the, the shot juxtaposed with something else that allowed the viewer to create some sense of, of narrative logic. And so that, that's the beauty or the magic of, of montage, of editing, is taking a shot and juxtaposing it with another shot. And that's how we, one fundamental way in which we make meaning out of films. Um, in another the uh, Kushloff had uh, a shot of an, an one actor walking screen left to screen right, um, and in the second shot, uh, an actor was walking screen right to screen left. In the third shot, they they meet at the the base of some stairs. One of the actors points to something off screen. There's a shot of a white house, and then in the final shot, the two actors walk up the stairs. Now, of course. Kushloff showed this to the test audience and said, what happened? Well, of course, these two characters meet, and they walk up these stairs to this white house. Um, and, of course, that, that makes you know, narrative sense. That has a sort of logic based on the, the principles of editing. Now, of course, what was really taking place was Kushloff had cut two actors that were in different parts of the city um, who were not walking towards one another at all. In the third shot, um, you know, they did meet, but that was at a different location. Um, the shot of the White House was actually the, the White House in the United States, you know, not in the Soviet Union. And then the fifth shot was in a completely different part of the city as well. So essentially, Kushloff had, had demonstrated that we, we take all these places that exist in nature, but because we splice them together and juxtapose them in a film, all of a sudden they create uh, a, a temporal as well as a spatial unity. And so this temporal and spatial unity that exists in film is not something that exists in nature. So it's a very constructed element. Um, and then in the final experiment here, uh, there was various shots, close-up shots of an actress's body parts. And of course, Kishoff showed this to the test audience and said, you know, well, what do you see here? And they're, oh, they're just different shots of this woman's body. Um, but in fact, all the shots were of different women's bodies. So. Um, there's a basis of, of body doubles there, right? So it doesn't have to be one person. It can be a composite of many different people. Um, another alternative in the Soviet tradition um, was what uh, is sometimes referred to as Eisenstein's montage or Soviet montage. And Sergei Eisenstein was a, a filmmaker. It's not Einstein, it's Eisenstein. Uh, and he was a very prominent filmmaker and theorist in the 1920s, very influential worldwide, um, again, until the reign of Stalin. And Eisenstein was sort of a, a card-carrying Marxist, and what he wanted in his uh, editing was to show uh, the class conflict. So conflict and, and collision were essential to Eisenstein's theory of montage. He wanted montage to be an intellectual and political and dialectical experience. So as opposed to the Hollywood tradition, which focuses more on crafting a, an emotional story, um, Eisenstein wanted a more of an intellectual, political approach to filmmaking. One way in Eisenstein's writing that he described what he's trying to do in his montage was by reference to the Japanese hieroglyph. 
which takes you know a picture of a dog and the picture of a mouth, right? Which are two individual things. The dog means a dog, and the mouth means to speak. But when you put them together, it creates a whole new meaning to bark, right? And that's what he wanted to do with his montage: is take one image and collide it with another image to come up with a whole new idea or image that would uh, evolve. And that, that's the basics of uh, the dialectics, is that you have a thesis, antithesis, you slam them together, and you get some sort of synthesis of the two. And so what you get in Eisenstein's films is, is not so much continuity or naturalism, but ideas that kind of mash together and collide together to come up with some other new idea. And so, partly this means that he uses discontinuity. So we might see actors repeat actions multiple times, and this is not because he was a terrible filmmaker and editor, but he was trying to, to prove a certain point. Uh, and he wanted it to be an intellectual experience. Uh, montage by Bazin. Bazin was a French uh, theorist, and he talked about three different types of montage that he saw. Uh, parallel, accelerated, and montage by attraction. In parallel montage, essentially he was talking about the type of editing that Griffith had deployed in the Hollywood system, where you can show actions that are occurring at the same time in different locations. Um, So-called cross accelerated montage, Bazin said, was um, that which Abel Gantz deployed by one example showing a, a, a train which is running um, and as opposed to you know it's run the, the train is running at a consistent speed but if we cut between the train and other lines of action and we cut back to the train but we start to decrease the amount of time that we show the train what it does is it creates the illusion of increasing speed so if the first time we see the train we see it for maybe seven seconds, and we cut away, we cut back, and we show five, cut away, cut back, and do four, three, two, one. It appears as if the, uh, the train is actually gaining speed, um, when in fact it's just consistently traveling at the same speed, but it's only the, the pace of the editing that has changed. And then the third type is montage by attraction, in that we have one image that is associated with another image that has no sort of compositional or realistic motivation. So remember all the way back to the, the narration lecture on different types of uh, motivations for accounting for film material. So composition refers to the cause and effect in the, uh, the narrative logic. Realistic, remember, is does it relate to, to real life things that we understand in the world. Now sometimes, and again this is more in the tradition of the art cinema rather than the Hollywood cinema, we might see images that do not relate to the compositional or realistic motivations, but instead they are there to make a metaphorical point. Um, one example would be in Eisenstein's film Strike, um, which is about a proletariat revolt in, uh, in the Soviet Union. We have an image of uh, the Tsar's troops who come in to kind of shut down this proletariat strike, and they start to slaughter um, the, uh, the, the civilians, and Eisenstein intercuts this with an image of a butcher slaughtering a bull. And of course the butcher and bull have no um, compositional or, or realistic motivation for being in this particular shot. They've not been established in the film world and they don't repeat later. They're not characters in the story. But it's obviously done for a metaphorical point. Um, Cross-cutting and parallel editing. Sometimes textbooks will use these terms synonymously. Um, but it's not quite the case. Um, to understand what the, the difference, cross-cutting is showing two or more events that take place at the same time in different locations. So timing is of the essence in cross-cutting. In parallel editing, it involves cutting between two or more events in which temporal simultaneity is not pertinent. So time is not of the essence in parallel editing. We might be cutting uh, between different things, uh, different scenes that have taken place um, days, weeks, months, years, or even centuries before. And we can think back to uh, D.W. Griffith's Intolerance, and you know here he cuts among four different lines of action throughout thousands of years in human history. So this is not cross-cutting per se, because we know that these are not taking place at the same time, but it's parallel editing. So he moves back and forth in time 
to make an intellectual point. Um, analytical versus constructive editing. In analytical editing, what we have is the filmmakers begin with an establishing shot. So they give you an objective point of view that allows the viewer to see and process the entire fabulous space, and then it breaks down that space into individual shots. It might be point of view shots. Whereas constructive editing omits that establishing shot. So the viewer then is forced to construct fabulous space by piecing together various point of view shots to try to create a sense of a whole. Um, and they might be given that establishing shot later on in the scene, or that establishing shot might be denied. Um, shot length. Filmmakers can adjust the duration of shot for various effects. Could be to create suspense, surprise, etc. Um, but historically speaking, the average shot length has decreased significantly. In the silent and classical era, the average shot length um, ran about 8 to 11 seconds. Now, in the Renaissance, which we classify somewhere in the late 60s, the 1970s, uh, in terms of, of U.S. history, um, the average shot length had decreased to about 4 to 6 seconds per shot. In the blockbuster era, which we define roughly about 1980 and, and, and on, what's implemented is what we call intensified continuity. So the basic principles of continuity have remained in force, but the only thing that's changed is the, the duration of the shot. And so shots last uh, roughly two to three seconds in, in the, the films on average by today. Now research shows that it takes at least 0.5 to two seconds for a viewer to process a new shot. So if you do the math on that, it doesn't leave you a lot of time to, to think about things from shot to shot. Now, the reason why we have intensified continuity, there's a variety of reasons. It's partly a result of television style. So te television style editing tends to be very frenetic. We get uh, shots that last less than a second. Um, and it's just shot, replaced with new shot, replaced with new shot, and on and on. Um, and it really leaves you very little time to think or process each shot. Now many contemporary directors, um, directors working today, began their careers making music videos or TV commercials where you know shots last a fraction of a second. So they're, they, they're sort of inundated with this particular style of editing. Um, it does appeal to viewers with short attention span. So if you're constantly bombarded with a new shot, uh, it's kind of sensory overload. You just kind of sit back and um, let it wash all, all over you as opposed to having to, to think about and analyze a shot. Um, longer shots are what was called the planned sequence. The planned sequence was kind of the foundation in classical Hollywood cinema post-Citizen Kane. Um, you know, films tended to be built around at least a few planned sequences where there's a, a very long, intricately planned out shot. Um, and these tend to become much fewer and fewer um, in today's filmmaking. Um, but again, the plan sequence is fairly common in classical era, post-Citizen Kane. It involves creating an in-depth composition where there's foregrounded, backgrounded space. Um, staging and blocking tend to be very intricate. The way in which the camera moves is very well constructed. By roughly 1980, directors favor more of a stand and deliver method where the actors kind of stand and deliver their lines. Um, the actors move about uh, more seldom and then more shallow focus tends to be used. When actors do walk, it's usually called a walk and talk sequence, which is made possible via the steady cam. Um, and finally, thinking about some of the ideology of continuity editing, so some of these basic assumptions. Um, the more that we view films with conventional continuity editing, the less we become aware of its principles. Uh, and some of these principles are, one, the notion that films should be easily accessible. So you should be able to watch a film and do very little work trying to figure out what's going on. And if, if filmmakers follow and obey the rules of continuity, continuity editing, then you don't have to rethink or think about or adjust to certain editing styles. They are just what exist. And so that frees you up to, to think about the story, and you don't really have to trouble too much about how the story is being edited. Um, in this sense, films in this style tend to be more emotionally involving rather than intellectual. If you think of uh, you know, the, the examples of, of the counter 
editing principles in Eisenstein. You know, these are very intellectual films, films where you're supposed to grapple with um, theoretical or, or philosophical, political ideas. And it's usually not the case in, in Hollywood films. So they tend to be less philosophical, less intellectual, and more emotional. Um, again, as I mentioned, the, the formal technique should be invisible, discreet, self-effacing. You're not supposed to think about how a film is edited. You know, and, and just simply try this out the next time you watch a film um, with someone. Ask them what they thought of the editing of the film, and they're likely to look at you as if you've simply sprouted another head or something, right? Because that's just not part of the uh, of, of the rubric. It's not what part of what you're looking for when you watch a film. Um, it's also continuity editing says that the filmmaker should guide the viewer through the story, pointing out information quickly. Um, rather than setting up a long shot and letting the viewer sort of contemplate that shot, letting the viewer kind of slowly um, dawn on the awareness of what's important in, in that particular shot, um, as the objective point of view might be. And again, that, that's something that, that's more in the tradition of the art cinema, right? Where you might have a long shot, a long objective static shot, where that forces the viewer to kind of meditate on it and, and think about it for a long time. Whereas if shots are only lasting a couple seconds, filmmakers need to point out the narrative information very quickly and move on to the next piece of information. And so that keeps the, the viewer, in a way, thinking less um, and kind of just going along for the ride. Um, and the result of uh, you know, continuity editing as ideology is that when we experience things that are different from that style, we tend to view them as either strange inferior or artsy. And so, again, they're typically reserved for what we call the art cinema, and as a result we tend to maybe write it off um, or, or view it as something strong. Um, so that's all for now, students. Um, tune in next time when we'll come up with a, a new technique to analyze and film.